Hello and welcome to this very special event organised by the BBC Stammering Support Network where we'll be discussing speech and stammering with a panel of inspirational people from the world of sport. The Stammering Support Network was set up two years ago by Felicita Baker, Clive Collins and Gautam Rangarajan. It is an internal network for BBC staff who stammer or for anybody within the BBC who has an interest in the subject or who would like to support somebody who has a stammer. Now, in addition to BBC staff, we have opened up today's session externally to the wider broadcasting industry and to the stammering community. Now, please note that the session is being recorded and it will be made available to watch again at a later date. And we'll be taking questions at the end, so please do send them in to, at the uh, Q&A question box or via email to stammeringsupport at bbc.co.uk. And anybody wishing to see the live captions or subtitles will need to click the CC button at the bottom of the screen. Now, I'm Hayley Hassel and I'm a presenter and reporter at the BBC. I've presented Newsrounds for almost 14 years now. But if you are over the age of 11 and haven't watched Newsround recently, then you may recognise me from presenting my own show on Radio 5 Live and being the investigative reporter for Radio 4 podcast series File on 4. And most recently, I got to present Woman's Hour just a few weeks ago, which, to be honest, I'm still buzzing about. It was brilliant. So you may think that if I'm presenting all the time on all these programmes to millions of people across the country, then I must find this easy. But the truthful answer is I don't. And I have a stammer, and I have done since the age of four. To be honest, my stammer has made many things difficult for me over the years, especially in my childhood. But it's also made me the person I am today. It's given me a great sense of empathy for others, um, an ability to value my words and choose them proactively. And I never underestimate the sheer effort and guts it takes for someone to speak out. It's also made me determined to speak out myself and to use words to make a difference in whatever way I can. And that's why I'm here today. Uh, not because I find these things easy, honestly, they're terrifying, but because they are important. And I know that everyone here today won't find this easy, but I'm so glad that they are here and able to share their stories too, so that we can all learn a bit more about speech disfluency and what it's like to have, to have a stammer. But enough about me, let me introduce you to our panel. First of all, we have Luke Aylin, who's the Premier League footballer with Leeds United. John Smith, OBE sports agent and entrepreneur. And Kelly Brown, who's retired Scotland's rugby union captain and current coach at Saracens. And joining us later will be Katie Walsh, who's the former leading national hunt jockey. And we'll be speaking to her live over Zoom from Gowran Park Racecourse at around 3.45, because she's live there presenting a race at the moment. Now, these are four people who are icons in their fields, but who have also struggled with a stammer along the way. So let's find out a bit more about what that's been like. Luke, I'm going to start with you if I can, because I know quite recently you spoke out on Match of the Day about having a stammer. And you actually said how you don't care anymore and want people to know about it. So I want to know what, what made you make that decision to speak up about it? Um, just then... then like I think for me, then like I'm doing more stuff like this. I'm uh, then like doing more media in football and stuff. And then like, I feel it was just time that people knew that I had a stutter. Like obviously people might have seen interviews and thought I maybe spoke in a different way or changed my words and didn't really make much sense. But that's because I was swapping words or thinking about it too much. So I feel it was just time just to kind of say, look, then like I have got a stutter, and then like this is something that I've lived with for my whole life. And since you've come out and talked about it, have you found it easier? Is the pressure off? Has it changed and helped in any way? Um, no, then uh, oh. just like, not really. <laughs> then like I still then uh, just and like, I don't mind doing this stuff now. Then like, I've kind of grown into it. Then like if you asked me to do this kind of stuff when I was 18, 19, 20, then like I would have said no. But yeah. I feel like as I've got older, I then uh, then uh, just and like, I said in that interview that I just don't really care anymore. And and uh, then then. Uh, just and I think that's the case. And it's not always been like that for you, has it? I know that it was much more difficult for you. So what was it like growing up with a stammer for you? Yeah, it was uh, then, like, it was hard in school and stuff, you know, then you know, just and like, you go to school and uh, just you might get asked to read something or ask a question and uh, then you really don't want to do it. So uh, then like, I shied away from it for years and still did up until I was probably 25, 26. And, mm -hmm. Then like, until I started getting more confidence to do stuff like this, so then like, it certainly has taken its time for me to do stuff like this. And what about playing f football? Because 
Was that something that helped you get away from the stammer? Was it something that you thought, I don't have to talk while I'm playing? Or was it not a consideration? Was it just the thing you were always going to do? Yeah, just then, like, I think I knew that I was fairly good from a young age, so then, like, it's something that I knew that I wanted to do, and then, like, it was easy for me to go out on a football pitch and talk on a football pitch because you're not talking, you're shouting, and uh, then mm -hmm. I find that quite easy. And then, like, on the football pitch, I'm probably one of the loudest players in the team, then like, I'm vice captain now, so then like, I have a voice in the dressing room, but it's more. Then like, I find that side of the game easy. Then like, I'm then like, good in the dressing room. So then like it certainly built my confidence being in that environment. So mm. then like, I'm very lucky with that. I know what you mean. My kids will tell you that shouting. I'm absolutely fine. Yeah, at. shouting's I've no got problem. That, I've got that yeah. sorted. <laughs> yeah. um, but I know you still have your insecurities now. You were saying that you often get your partner to order to order food when you go through a drive-through and things like that. Do you still find that yeah that it conquers you a little bit? Oh yeah, just then like I wouldn't then then I wouldn't go to a drive through and then like order what I want. So then like, I want a coffee, then like the coffee that I want I can't say. So then like I always say flat white because I know I can say it. So I drive up, then I ask for flat white. Then right. like, I don't really want that much milk, but I've got to do it <laughs> because I can't be bothered to sit on a drive through for that long. So yeah, then like it still plays its parts in certain areas of my life, but the the like, most important areas of my life of speaking to people, like having a good time and that, like, I, didn't, like, I don't think about it one bit. Yeah, it's funny, the hardest thing for me is picking up the phone and interviewing someone when other people are watching in the office. Yes. It's that sort of thing of, I think when you go through a drive through everyone knows what you're going to say, mm. everyone's looking at you, there's someone right, it, it's the pressure as well of the environment, isn't it? Yeah. It's those small things that actually people don't know are yeah. quite difficult. Yeah, and uh, just in, uh, just, now I've been, uh, like, it's my first time being in a studio like mm -hmm. this and then I've just watched you read like on script and I couldn't do that. There's no way I could sit there and read off a script and do that. It was just playing my mind for the time leading up to it and I'd be in absolute pieces. So talking and having conversations I'm fine with, but anything that I know that I've got to say, I'll be the nice and no go. We'll see, I used to be like that, but now yeah. I do it every day, yeah. it's a bit easier, so yeah, we'll see. To, yeah. do, do you think the world of football is starting to accept speech difficulties? Is that the sort of reason you've spoke out do you find it's more accepting now has anything changed recently uh yeah then like i think with social media and everything now that you're more in the spotlight so it's more spoken about and it's okay. it's more out there so then, like, when i first started at 18 19 there wasn't as many social media platforms so then, like, if i did do an interview it might only go out and i'll be stammering and stuff and people wouldn't really realize it but now there's so many stuff on the internet that then like, you can see that it's out there so it certainly helped. Yeah, you're less alone in a way, aren't you? Yes, yes, 100%. Um, John, I'm going to bring you in now because you obviously go, well, I know you go around the world talking and giving inspirational speeches to hundreds of people, um, but you have a speech disfluency. How has that made you do what you do now? Is it something that you found positive in your life or negative? That's a very good question because the obvious answer is it was negative and for many years, certainly for the first 15 of my 15 years of my life where I, where I really couldn't talk about I was christened Jonathan Smith and I couldn't say Athan, couldn't say the letter A. So people would say, what's your name? And I'd go, J -j 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 and eventually John would come out and the other party would be so pleased I got something out that out would come the hand and I became John Smith. And that's, that's. But over time, it's defined me because two things. Firstly, it, it inspired me to, if, if I couldn't communicate, then I had to do something else. And I'm not in these guys' leagues, but I did end up running for Great Britain as a, as a kid. And so the Mickey taking kind of stopped. And bear in mind, this was mm -hmm. in the 60s and, you know, Mickey taking was, <laughs> was an industry. Uh, it was an Olympic sport, I think, in those <laughs> days. And suddenly, you know, I was achieving something else, and that gave me the confidence to relook at my communication. Um, so and I would say to anybody who's, who stammers, accept it. It's you. Don't be afraid of it. It's your shadow. You can play with it. You can manipulate it. You can sideline it, because you can do other things. And the more you do, the more the shadow disappears. It gets, mm. it gets lighter. Um, now I, I use it 
I hope to my advantage. So if I'm giving talks or I'm um, on a TV panel trying to fight for airtime, as you do sometimes, I just pause. And suddenly the world has to stop, and because I'm mid-sentence now, people have to stop and listen to what I'm going to say next. And for me, it's a regroup of my mind, reassembles the words in a few mm. seconds, because two seconds is, it seems like a long time, but it's actually not to the listener. And it empowers you. So you can use it and you can embellish it. And over time, it, it becomes a very useful weapon in your armory. I see that. Even then, when you paused, we were all, <laughs> you, you had us there, and it was a really good tool. When you say you sort of, you had to, create your confidence and you did that by running or creating confidence from somewhere else do you think you need confidence in order to be able to conquer it live with it deal with the stammer yes because it look I, I, I've lived my life with people who are disfluent and in some cases it's their mate so they don't it doesn't bother them that much that's cool end of that sentence for me the next sentence read but it's a bully and I don't like being bullied. So, you know, and I'm a little guy, as you can see, so I definitely don't like being bullied. And, you know, I, I, I get angry with it, uh, and I want to put it in its box, and so I use it to channel energy mm. as well. And you now talk to hundreds of people. Is, is you standing up talking about it part of you dealing with, with it, accepting it, or is it more about teaching other people how to accept it? I, I, I hope a little bit of both. I don't want to put myself up on a, on a pedestal, but if I can speak to a group, and, I, and I've spoken to um, in the days when Stammer was called the British Stammering Association, um, I used to speak at the conferences, and I thought if I could just help one person to walk away from here and, and feel a little light of load, then I've achieved something worthwhile. And also, you, you've talked about your work with Stammer there. How have they helped you? What does Stammer do to help you? be who the person you are now? Well, it's a repository of our emotions. Okay. So people who work with, with Stammer who are disfluent know that they've got somebody somewhere to go to. I mean, thank God in the 2020s we have, well, sometimes it's difficult to understand how or why, we have a caring society. It doesn't seem that way some, sometimes. But, you know, if you have many ailments, there are places where you can go, obvious places mm. where you can go if you can't see, if you can't hear, if you've got one leg, if you've got whatever, whatever, whatever. And we are a much more caring and understanding society than when I grew up. Um, however, there was nothing really for stammering. Stammering was a joke when I grew up. You know, oh, he can't talk. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a joke. Mm. It's a way of life. And, and stammer has... Um, and the lady who runs it, Jane, is, 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 is so embracing of all forms of, of disfluency. It, it's a, literally a repository of the emotion of people who are disfluent. There's a home. There's a place you can go and be yeah. you. And you can grow whatever personality you want out of yourself with their help. That's great. It's just inspiring listening to you talk about it. And you are a sport agent, so you see the other side of the field from these guys. What, the people who are employing those people in the sports teams and to go on telly, what is their attitude to stammering? Is there more work that needs to be done there? Are they beginning to accept it? Uh, absolutely, there's more work that needs to be done. There is no attention to it at all. Um, Luke was just saying, you know, they, they'll chuck him out there in front of a camera and say, go, it's your turn, you're the vice captain, go do the interview. Um, and it's tough, you know, it is tough, you know, you, you, you even sitting in a studio, it's a different way of life. I mean, I was laughing. We were sitting quietly before you recorded this. It's the antithesis to what goes on in these guys' dressing rooms. It's all, yeah, come on, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. Gonna do. <laughs> this is like, shh, quiet. So, you know, it's... That's what it was like in here before. What yeah, that's about? right. <laughs> so it's all that, you know, yes, there should be media training. It's slowly coming into I mean, the, the, the Premier League are getting better at it. Um, but as you go through the leagues, there's not much support. At all, right. and, and, and I'm, I'm sure Kelly will talk about other, um, rugby and other sports as well. It, it is definitely something which should be 
on the agenda of all sporting franchises. Yeah, and talking about it more, which is what we're doing today. Correct. Um, before we go to you, Kelly, I just want to remind everybody to send in your questions, please. We'd love to get as much as your inv involvement in this today. Um, you can send it to stammering support at bbc.co.uk. Um, I'm going to come to you now, Kelly, because you have been a great success on the rugby field and then were captain and now coach, which brings with it that other side of being a sports personality, the fact that you have to um, give speeches, commentate, talk to the media. How has it been dealing with that side of the job? It's the big thing I would say was in about 2010, mm -hmm. it sort of it changed everything uh, in that year. So for me, I, I was asked if I would do an interview uh, before the Scotland-France game at the start of the Six Nations. And so I did it. I was absolutely terrified, but I did it, and it was it was shocking. I stammered, I stuttered, I blinked, and I twitched, and all this sort of stuff. And I was actually I was so embarrassed. I called the media manager and I said, "Could you please ensure that that interview is never shown?" No. But it was a catalyst for me because on that day I was sort of I sort of I was fed up, and I got to the point where I was like, "Okay, I'm fed up of my stammer being." in control of me, I'm going to get in control of it. I want to, um, I, at that point I started to think, you know, I could have been Scotland captain, but I, in the back of my mind, I was like, no, I'm a stammerer, you know, I can't do this, I can't do this. But as I said, on that day, it changed absolutely, absolutely everything because I decided to, I decided to challenge it uh, and I decided to really try and take as much control of it as I possibly could. And so, I'm still a stammerer, and I always will be, but I know if I work hard, I'm in control of my stammer as opposed to it being in control of me. Yeah. But growing up, before that, before you had that training, what was life growing up for you? Because I imagine you were, you were quite a big lad. You kind of yeah, feel yeah. like you could take care of yourself, but obviously having a stammer creates that vulnerability, doesn't it? How, how did you cope with that growing up? Yeah, I think I was fortunate because uh, I was never bullied. I mean, I was quite big yeah. uh, <laughs> and I had an older brother, uh, so that also helped. But um, again, another day that sort of sticks out was I was I was 11 and I'd been on a ski trip and I was asked if I would speak about it in the school assembly and I stood up and I had a script. I practised it all day, I practised it and then I stood up and absolute silence, <laughs> absolute silence. I couldn't say a word, I just completely blocked. And then sort of one or two of the smaller kids sort of started to nudge each other, and then one or two of the older kids sort of maybe started to laugh. And that was probably the first time I noticed that, oh, right, I do have something a little bit different. And I got on that day, I got, I got a feeling that I'd say a lot of stammerers get, a bit, of, a bit of shame, a bit of embarrassment, a bit of why me, a bit of it's not fair. Uh, but I was saved. The teacher, I think, obviously saw you know what was going on and was able to ask me some questions. And as a consequence of that, I was able then to get through it. Um, and then as I was growing up, as I said, I was lucky. I wasn't bullied. And the majority of the time, I was OK. But it just every now and again, it would come back. Um, and a lot of the time, it sort of stopped me doing you know certain things that I wanted to be and I still striving to be eloquent and when I was a kid I wasn't that because I would substitute words, I would change words, I would say things I could say as opposed to the exact sort of words. Um, it's a listen to Luke before he said he gets his wife at times you know, to order, you know the number of times that I would go into a restaurant and I would sit down I would choose the seat where I thought the staff would go to and so I could point and little things like that. Uh, I would say a bit of a joke, so the number of times I'd fish and I didn't actually want fish. <laughs> <laughs> but I could save word. fish <laughs> yeah. and the waiting staff no, hadn't come I and stood that. beside me so I had to change it. You know, I, was, uh, yeah. I would have loved that steak but unfortunately uh, I didn't get it. It's, you're talking about yourself when you were 11, stood up there. It, I think it's something that rings true for all of us. I remember being 11 and standing up in the assembly exactly the same and not being able to speak. But you, you overcame that. Was, is it sort of, did you see that as a challenge to sort of push yourself? Because it would have been quite easy to 
sit back at the back of the class and never talk ever again in the classroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah I saw it. I saw it as a challenge. I think, I think sort of what I went on to do as a living. It's a sign. I think I'm pretty competitive, um, and so I didn't want it to hold me back. But I would have said it's probably until I was 27 or 28. I'd achieved a fair bit, but it was still there. It was holding me back a little bit. And then that's when I said I did the interview in 2010 and it just changed everything. And now I just want to challenge myself as much as I can. I want to be in speaking situations that make me unbelievably uncomfortable because I know if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be sort of fully in control of my stammer, I've got to do that. Mm. I can't shy away from anything anymore. And we talked about Stammer before, but, but you went through the Maguire programme at that point, didn't you? Can you tell us a little bit about how they work and how they helped you? Oh, yeah. So that's... And there's lots of different things out there. And that was massive for me. It was massive for me. So there's the cycle of speech and a cycle of breathing, uh, but there's also the psychological side. And so... And a big thing they speak about is the real assertive self-acceptance. And that's probably the hardest part. As soon as you accept it, as soon as you embrace it, which uh, I do now, it's part of me. I've gone from, I've gone from being a uh, sort of why me, to, as John said, it's almost it's almost like a superpower at times, and mm. uh, and you can use it and you can embrace it, and so that that uh, as you said, so the program it changed everything, but also also it forces you to face up to it, and so uh, on the third day I think it is, so you've got to go into the streets. And you've got to, and and you've got two hours to speak to a hundred people, um, which is pretty intimidating. But it's all part of of the challenge and to facing up to it. And um, John was talking before about that changing room environment, and um, I imagine it's not the most patient and sensitive place. I wouldn't know, but but having a stammer in that environment, how do you? How do you cope with that? Because I imagine there's Mickey taking, and it just seems horrendous to me. Like, how do you cope with that? Just, and I've always felt it was a place where I've been able to talk, I've been able to really? show my feelings, yeah, and then that, that's never bothered me, that side of it, then that going into, then uh, like maybe if you sign for a new club and you're first, like actual going into the dressing room, you might be a bit nervous and you might not talk as much as you want, but I mean, in general, I mean, I'm talking from me personally, like the lads that I've played with, they've always, yeah, then like some days they might have a laugh if a starter goes on a bit too long or something and they might have a little giggle or they might wait till I go out of the room and then I've spoke to boys that they've said then on my first day that I was around the table and then I was just having a chat then like I was talking then when I left they had a laugh but uh, then like, it told me years ago after and I was like then, like, then like, I don't mind that I, I honestly it doesn't it doesn't affect me but then like, I've always been very comfortable in a changing room atmosphere or going into a changing room so it's never bothered me. And do you think it's more tolerant now, Kelly? Yeah, absolutely. And and I, it's kind of it's part of the fun as well. Everyone's got something, yeah. and you almost feel if people are too, if they're walking on eggshells around yeah. you, you almost don't feel a part of it, you know, because everyone's mm. got some issue, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so it's never be, it's never been an issue, you know. We have a laugh about it. I, pro I probably help because I, I would laugh about it too. Yeah, same. Yeah, so same. you'd be exactly yeah, the same. Well, then I'll make a joke about it. Then I'll say, oh, well, then, like, that was a long one, wasn't it? Yeah. And it'll just like, <laughs> break it straight away. So yeah, it's, completely agree. it's never been an issue for me in the dressing room. Yeah, I think, yeah. yeah laugh at it before others can. Exactly. exactly. Um, we're getting lots of messages in for you, so I'll read a few of them now. Um, this one from Lisa says, um, has having a stammer helped the panel to lead or captain a team of players or staff? Does showing determination and other positive qualities to deal and live with a stammer impact on their leadership style or gain respect from their teammates? Sorry, that, that was from Stephen. Um, I don't know whether, What's as a captain, do you want so to... Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I think it does. It maybe, as you said at the start, it maybe gives you a sense of, of empathy. Um, it's because you understand you know, yeah. people have got struggles because you've you faced it. And so, yes, it does... Um, and I think, I think from that, so one of the big things I always thought as a captain, as a leader or whatever, is you've got to care as well. Mm. And so that's the other thing. So maybe sort of tied in, you know, with the empathy. If you can really show, you know, the players or your teammates, you know, that you, is you really care about them and you care about the team. And so, yeah, I would say it definitely has 
it shaped um, it shaped sort of my style. I would have said. Okay. Um, Lisa has asked, "What's the one thing you would tell your younger self about your stammer?" John, I don't know whether you want to. Well, answer that. that's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, just want to backtrack a second before I answer that. Which is a little tricky to use because I'm trying to think of the answer, so I'll think about <laughs> I something. Can go to I want someone to say else first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so no, I, um, we, Kelly was just talking about the empowerment of it. There is nothing, there is nothing in my 70 years that I've achieved, which is bigger than being able to talk. Yeah. So whatever I've done, you know, when I ran for Britain and I did pretty well, when I got my OBE and shook hands with. Prince William, who was wonderful, by the way, and really interested in stammering. Mm -hmm. Really good guy. Great moments in, in my life. Um, nothing gives me that enormous adrenaline pride and mm -hmm. rush as walking off a stage or walking up a studio or talking to a group of people as, yeah, I actually did that. And, and I've learned a couple of really good things on, on route. You talked about being, being bullied, although I don't think many people bully you, but, <laughs> but having said all that, we were, and maybe you were as well over, over time, um, trying to win a position where you feel empowered yourself. The, yeah. One of the best ones that I've learned on interviews, which are always difficult for people who are disfluent, and you've got, I don't know, an interviewer who could be your future boss or whatever it might be, who's looking at you, and it's very intimidating. Mm -hmm. A lovely little tip: Look at the bridge of the nose. Don't look at, don't look anywhere else. It's absolutely fascinating. I can look at you all day long and not blink. And it also empowers your brain to look at the nose. So you're thinking, you're more conscious of where your eyes are. I'm still looking at the bridge of your nose. <laughs> I'm and, conscious of it now. You know, it really. And, and what happens is that the other person sort of starts doing this because they. It's really. Mm. And once they do that. You're okay. Ah, that's so a good tip. Yeah, just thought I'd throw I it wish out I'd there. known but that years ago. My <laughs> first TV interview, I blinked the whole way through yeah, to try and get over everybody my Everybody does. I everybody wish I'd does. Have known Sorry, that. what was the question from Lisa? <laughs> the question <laughs> was what you would tell your younger self. Um, you know, that that time before you were before you turned fifteen. Um, yeah. if you could have told your younger self what you know now, what would you okay. tell I would him? say nothing is forever. Mm -hmm. You know, this is whatever you're going through now, at, at fifteen, thirty seems really old. When you get to 30, you think, oh, 40's a stretch. When you get to 40, you think, oh, 50's around the corner. <laughs> well, when you get to 70, you don't care anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, give me the jabs. I don't care if they do anything to me. It doesn't matter. Um, but it, so, yeah, nothing's forever. What, the, the worst position you are, if you can't communicate, don't worry. Mm. There's lots of time. You will be able to. That's good. Right. Kelly, what would you say to your younger self, you know, before 2010? Mm. What do you wish you'd have been able to say? I would just say, um, it's a two things. One, it's going to be okay. Like, I, I genuinely, I've gone through life and I genuinely, I've got this sort of feeling that everything will be all right. Like, so whatever the trials, the ups and downs, it sort of ties in a little bit to what, uh, to what uh, you said, John, you know, with nothing like that. But it's, everything will be okay. And the second thing is just, is that, is that real, um, is a real sense of anything is possible, mm. and so you know whatever you want to do, you can do it. And and will you be frightened at times? Yeah, you will. But if you truly want to do it, okay, then go for it, and you'll find a way. Brilliant. Um, one for you now, Luke. Um, Colm has asked, as a Leeds fan, um, how did you find talking to referees? during matches, and should referees and officials be more aware of stammering? Um, just I've never had a problem because I'm usually shouting at them. Yeah, so I've never had any problems. But then, like, I think, then, like, I've had chats with referees, then, uh, then, like, we usually have, like, a meeting before the game, then, like, if you're captain, and we've had, had chats, uh, and they've always been pretty good to me, like, they've never brought it up or anything. So, then, like, I think it's then I think it's all okay in that department. I've never come across a referee and they've said something sarky or something like that. Then like, I've always found it fine. That's good to know. Um, Chris would like to know, um, how do you all feel, um, that, how do you feel that stammering is portrayed in the media um, and do you feel it's changed over the years? I mean, I was watching a drama the other night and um, there was 
the, the person with the stammer was the homeless drunk. And I just kind of think, why isn't it the executive of the, of, of the business or whatever it was, was on telly? Um, and sometimes that infuriates me a little bit, the stereotype of a stammerer. Um, I don't know how you feel about it. I think it's um, sadly portrayed wrongly as a weakness. Mm. It's the character, apart from I, Claudius, on the BBC a long, long, long time ago, who was a Roman emperor who had a mm. speech impediment. But apart from, from that, it's comical, or yeah. it's the weaker of the characters. Or occasionally, well, occasionally, it's only happened once, I think, it's, apart from Claudius, it's, um, it's portrayed as a historical element, such as the King's Speech. Yes. Which was a great story, uh, and actually well portrayed, very well portrayed by, I mean, Colin was fantastic in that, in that role. So, no, it's, uh, generally speaking, it's poor, poorly defined. Um, we've got one here from Phoebe, who's a speech therapist, and she says um, she works with children and young people who stammer, and she says, firstly, thank you so much for everything you're doing to get stammering into the mainstream media. Um, it makes such a difference to the kids I work with. And her question is, what would you say to young people who are struggling to accept their stammer right now? You want to that one? <laughs> just then over Justin, I think that then Justin, like the guys have brought it up before that then look, then that is, then that you might not be so comfortable now, but as you grow into it, you'll be comfortable. So start now, like you can, then that is, then like it's a lot more out there than when I was younger and, and then that definitely when they were younger. So it's like, do it now. Then that start to speak out, start to go out there and say, say things that you want to say, like don't be scared to do it. I think it's great that these guys, I'm not because I happen to be sitting next to them, but it's great that they've come out and they've put that behind mm. them and they've conquered their fear and they've gone out because these guys don't have to prove anything. So, you know, they've done it in life. And so to come out and actually say, okay, and I'm going to show you here, yeah, I'm going to talk, I'm going to do, and the amount of positive influence they, they put back into the community is phenomenal. I, uh, I think it's very kind of you, but I think it's also, it's almost uh, a responsibility on us to do that because, mm. well, that, I know, so my daughter stammers mm. and she's 11 and it's only, there's only a couple of things um, uh, and she's got a little bit upset and no parent obviously, obviously wants to see that, but I kind of, I see myself as, I've got to be a role model and that's the best thing I can do for her and I can go and try and do things, try and do interviews and I can speak to her about it and say listen I'm doing an interview but I am I'm frightened, like I'm genuinely frightened, I'm terrified about doing this but I'm going to do it and so I try and set an example for her and to try and sort of let her see that it doesn't define you and in the same way I think it's why it's so important you know that that you know we can actually speak about it and hopefully if we can help like like if we can help sort of one person or if we, or if we can help sort of one kid you know who maybe dreams of being a footballer then then it's been amazing and i think and i think that certainly is from my side is why i want to speak about it as much as i can because i want to i want to see if i can help people I think it's brilliant what you're all doing. Like when I was 11, I didn't know anyone who had a, who, who had a stammer. I, I can't name one person. And so I felt completely on my own. Um, and I'm sure it was similar for all you. So Absolutely, I'm sure yeah. for anyone yeah, yeah. out there who is a football fan or a rugby fan or just knows you will but, be massively but also there's a, there's a, a lot of the interviews that I've done over the years have all been about how I've converted commas, overcome it. It's still there with me. Yeah. I mean, people don't see it because I'm very good at masking it now. Um, maybe I should have been an actor in a pre maybe I was an actor <laughs> in a previous life. But um, if you are disfluent, there's no shame in that. And I think part of what we should be saying to the stammering community is, yeah, you get over it if you can, and, and you will, because uh, funnily enough, as you grow older, it normally evolves with you. But if you don't, 
it's you. Don't, we, don't have to, we don't have to cure stammering. Mm. It's part of your being. I mean, we have to do things around the community that help. For instance, yeah. the thing that w concerns me, worries me, about um, a lot of these answering services, you know, you, you phone a bank or this one or that one, and it gives you verbal options. Mm -hmm. And if you can't articulate mm. yeah. that in a verbal manner of coherence, you get cut off. So that's something I really think, if we can take that, one of the things from this program is that, is to make a real drive to help people who can't communicate deal with automated machines. Yeah. Because people don't actually like talking to you very much on a mobile that's phone a great these, these days. Uh, we've got a question here from Max. He says, um, a question for all of you actually. Have you experienced blocking or stammering during a match um, where instant communication is vital? Um, such as you were making a pass in rugby or football and needed to simultaneously communicate an instruction. If so, has stuttering ever held you back on the actual field of play? On the actual field, no. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably because sort of similar to look as if you're shouting, yeah. it's fine. And when things are going fast, um, when I'm speaking, as I'm going around the pitch, I'm speaking to my teammates, it just... It just happens. It's just instinctive. It's almost, it's almost when you don't think. Yeah. As soon as you're thinking about it, as soon as you're thinking about, okay, I better not stammer. Then there's a fair chance you're going to stammer. Yeah. But on the pitch, it's not. So the only time it ever, ever did off the pitch, it was, uh, it was in the Six Nations in 2013, and it was doing the coin toss, yeah. and so, and so the other captain. He tossed the coin, and I started trying to, and I started trying to call, and I was trying to call uh, heads, and I was, I completely blocked, and it went up and came back down and bounced, and so we had to do the coin toss, uh, and so we had to do the coin toss twice, and so the second time I was like, okay, well I'm going to call heads, and he tossed it, and he went up, he came down, and at the last second I got a heads, heads, heads. And of course it was a tails. Uh, yeah, so I lost it anyway. oh, no. uh, but that's the only time it ever has. Wow. What about you, Luke? Yeah, no, same. Then I've I've never had that on the pitch. Mm. You know, for me, it's then like you're not saying full sentences on the pitch. You're shouting one word. You're shouting certain words to help your teammates. So it's not like I'm not sitting here and having to think what I'm saying. Then I'm I'm then I'm just out on the pitch. Things are going fast, so I'm just shouting like right shoulder, left shoulder, things like that, which I know that I can get out. So it's never so that's never come up in the game. Then like the only time that it does come up is maybe in meeting rooms, you know, when we're sitting there and the night the the other the night the uh, the night coach and the manager will ask you what you think or something and then that can be a little bit scary but then I've got to an age now where I can speak out and I'm I'm quite good in their meeting rooms mm -hmm. but when I first started going into a proper dressing room because I mean I was nineteen when I left Arsenal to go to Yeovil and I mean there weren't nobody knew who I was at Yeovil and then nobody knew I had a star. So going into that dressing room and maybe and having to speak and then I don't know in rugby then like we have to sing on our first away journeys and that was just like the most nerve wracking thing I've ever <laughs> done in my life having to stand up on a chair and sing. So there, so so like they're the only times when it's played a part in my sporting career. And what about team talks like being captain and vice captain? Is that is that something that you're able to do easily? Yeah, yeah. Then, like I spend most of my time with my teammates. I spend a lot of time with them, so I'm comfortable around them. Like I don't really start in front of my wife and kids because I'm comfortable around them. And um, like in the dressing room, I then like I feel at home with my teammates. So it's pretty. Then that's like, pretty simple for me. Then like, sometimes I might start on a word, but I can change it up. I can think about a different word and something. So it's never stopped me from speaking out in the dressing room and team talks yeah. or anything. I hope to the times on telly and radio I've, I've stammered quite often, but I hope to think that everyone will remember that sentence yes. because I've said it three times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Kelly? Does that come up when you're doing your team talks and you're trying to inspire people but the words just won't come out? It, I would have said no, I don't think it does. I'm, 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 very, um, I'm very comfortable in that now. I'm very comfortable in that, in that environment. And so that's is probably why I look for mm. other environments where I'm I'm not as comfortable because I want to keep on 
I, I want to keep on uh, uh, challenging uh, myself and improving. But in that environment now, it's fine. So, but definitely, it's a going back. I would hold back in team meetings. I would often, it's so the coach would ask a question. I'd think, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but I, I just wouldn't say it. Um, uh, but now I feel, yeah, I'm comfortable in that environment, so it's not, it's, it, it's not a problem. Um, Rebecca sent a message here, um, quite interesting. She says, as someone without a stammer, are there things I can do to support those who do? Is there anything you wish you could tell everyone else what they can do to, to make it easy for you? Don't finish everybody's sentence. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Let everyone be what, what they are. Um, yeah, I, I used to find that really disconcerting. Um, I'm trying to say something. Someone has put the words out there, and inevitably they weren't quite what I was going to say anyway. So, no, just, just be patient and wait. Yeah. That's what they do. And to follow on from that, Tricia says, um, she asks, if I am speaking to someone with a stammer, there's sometimes the urge to finish the word or sentence <laughs> of the person. Yeah. Um, she's not sure if that's being helpful or rude. Will we all agree that it's better to let them finish the sentence? Yes. Yeah, let, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Let's let finish. Yeah. I feel the same. I feel the same. Um, well, I think Katie is ready. I think we can go to Katie now. Um, so Katie Walsh. Hi, Katie. Can you hear us? I can indeed. I can't see anybody, but oh, I can hear. Oh, <laughs> lovely to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that you've literally just finished reporting on the race. How did it go? Yeah, listen, we're, we're here in uh, Gorn Park uh, today at the race. This is a big uh, race meeting on the Tayeste's chase and um, a huge crowd. So literally just finished, just came off air about five minutes ago. So I'm after finding the quietest spot that I can because there's uh, a lot of people outside having a great time. So I, I think I'm in the most appropriate place at this moment in time. We massively appreciate it. Now, um, I'm joined here by three wonderful gentlemen, but I feel very much left out because stammering is um, more commonly um, seen in, in males than it is females. So as a woman growing up in Ireland um, with a stammer, how did it affect your life? Um, it affected my childhood more so than my life. Um, I think I, I always remember having a stammer all through primary school, um, first class, so five, six, seven, all the way up, I think, um, until I was maybe, I'd say from the time I was six or seven until I was maybe 14 or 15, I found that period in my life extremely difficult with a stammer because I just think everything's harder at that age, isn't it? Mm. Like, I mean, you don't really, you're trying your best to find your way in every sense of the world. And then to be burdened with a stammer is just an absolute nightmare. You're trying to make friends and you are you don't have the confidence to do that either because you're afraid to speak. Um, so I kind of turned all of my energy um, towards sport uh, because I loved being outside. Um, I loved being active and um, I was, you know, I was loved to be part of all of that. And I got great confidence through sport and um, that definitely helped me. Um, but it was extremely difficult. It, it, as a, Right now at the minute, it doesn't bother me having a stammer that my stammer, I wouldn't, I don't really, I don't feel like I have a stammer anymore. There is occasions where, um, you know, sometimes I can get caught off guard or if I read something or if you ask me to read the paper aloud, I would struggle. Um, but in everyday life, has it affected me from the time I was in my 20s? No. Um, I put all that down to the, the Maguire program for me. That, that was a, a massive um, changing point in my life. Um, and that was the way forward for me to get out of the hole that I was in because I just couldn't, it got so bad for me and I'm sorry, I'm quite late to this conversation, but it got so bad for me through my childhood where I used to pull my hair out from the top of my head. I used to pull my eyebrows out, used to pull my eyelashes out. I couldn't, I couldn't get the words out and I found that so frustrating. But as I got older and with the Maguire programme, and then as I got older with confidence and 
I suppose, through my career of riding racehorses and meeting new people, I just got more confident and I just knew how to deal with it. So at this moment in time, having a stammer doesn't bother me at all. But I will say there was some very rough times when I was 10, 12, 13, that time. I found that time ex extremely hard. And Katie, when you talk about pulling your hair out and pulling your eyelashes out, is that a kind of a, a distraction or does it help you get the words out? What were you going through when <laughs> well, you were trying to do that? That's, it must have been well, extremely difficult for you. Anyway, because I was, um, um, I was pulling a lot of hair out, so it definitely wasn't helping me get the words out. I think I was just so angry at myself that I couldn't get the words out. And I just got used to get so frustrated with it that it, it, I used to, I don't know if I felt like I inflicted pain on me that it would help me get the words out. That I used to pinch the side of my leg mm. to see if that would help. Like clearly all of those things were the wrong thing to do. But I was just at an age where I didn't know what was going to be the answer. And when I look back now, um, you know, I'm 38 now. So when I look back, I could only imagine what my parents were going through when they, when they could see that I was pulling my hair out and then it would grow back a bit and then I'd go at it again or I'd go at my eyelashes or my eyebrows and it must have been heartbreaking for my parents. I didn't really see all that back then. I was only thinking really about myself and I was like, oh, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. But when I look back now at my age, I think as a parent, that must have been um, a massive concern. I know now as a mother that if any of my kids were doing that, you know, um, and I think something had to be done. And that's when my mother came across came across the Maguire program for me to be able to do that. And that was a massive changing point in my life. And I know you were one of the youngest people to ever do the Maguire program. So how did, how did it help you and how did it turn things around for you? Um, I suppose because I had never met anybody really that had a stammer quite the way that I felt I had until I entered that room and realized that my stammer actually is not as bad as other people in this room. And I felt like we were all in the same situation. And I think we all got confidence off each other because we were all in this situation and no one really knew how to deal with it. And no one, and there was people in there that were a lot older than me. Like I was the youngest. There was people in there like, well, in of all ages, you know, and I just, you know, I suppose I got there at a good age and at a good point in my life because I could change things around. But, you know, it must be soul destroying and, and very difficult for some people to go through their whole lives the way that I felt at that time. But then I don't know, as people get older with confidence, I think, you know, I know people now with a stammer and I know one particular person and he, he really struggles, but it doesn't bother him at all. He's married with a couple of kids and he has no issue with it um i went to him one day and asked him you know would he would he ever been interested did he ever hear about the mcguire program and he's like no i'm okay i don't mind you know so mm. i admire him for it i couldn't have continued on like that but to him you know he can get through everyday life and it doesn't affect him at all and is it something you still have to deal with? Um, Joshua has just sent in a question saying, do you have morning routines you have to go through? Because he's just started his Maguire course in November, actually, and he's trying to start off every day strong. And he's wondering whether it's something that's still, that you still have to deal with now. Uh, no, I actually don't anymore. You know, obviously the breathing exercises and meeting all the new people, and it's such a long time ago now, I don't even really remember. I mean, I think, and, and in one sense, you know, um, that's great because that is in the past for me that I I remember the exercises, but do I have to practice them every day? No, I think as I got over it and got more confident and I think obviously the breathing exercises was the way forward, but I just got more confident through the breathing exercises that I was able to get through my sentences, was that I was able to answer the phone, that I was able to have conversations. And then I forgot about doing, I didn't feel like I needed to do the breathing exercises as much 
And then eventually, then it all just kind of came. Now, I am a bit of a devil for swapping around words in my own head. <laughs> I like even having this conversation with you. There's words that I want to say in sentences that I know when I get to it, I'm going to struggle. So I'll just mm. throw in another word last minute. Yes. And I think we're all guilty of that. And... Um, I think anyone with a stammer will do that. You will swap around a sentence because you know you're going to have a particular issue with a particular word. So I will uh, swap different ones around, but I don't have to do any breathing exercises anymore. And obviously from going from that, you are now commentating. In fact, today you've just been interviewing the winning jockey, which I imagine is an incredibly pressurised environment. How, how do you cope with that now? Um, I actually don't ever uh, think about my stammer anymore at all. There will be the odd word here or there, but I think everyone within within the industry I'm in, I, I worked in I work in horse racing my whole life, and I know everyone really within the industry mm -hmm. to a degree. And I suppose um, um, through confidence as well as being a jockey and riding winners on horses and meeting different trainers and different owners and I suppose being in situations where I had to speak before a race and after a race and I had to explain what happened out in the track and I think when your adrenaline is up it seems to be a bit easier to get the conversation out so it's a bit like that when I go to do a post-race interview my adrenaline will be up and um I'll be just after watching the race and I'm kind of caught in the moment as well and I kind of feel that I'm very comfortable with the guys that I'm talking to and the girls because I know them all extremely well. And I suppose for me, the biggest key is that what makes it easier for me definitely is the fact that this has been my whole life. So I kind of, um, I know every part of it and I know exactly what happened out there within the last five minutes. And I feel like I've loads of confidence behind the questions that I'm asking. Um, I certainly would not be as confident if you asked me to do a post-tennis match interview. I think <laughs> Don't worry, be we won't ask you to do that. <laughs> there will be massive issues with that. But I think it's definitely easier, like anything in life, when you have the confidence to... Mm. Um, I, I suppose when you know it's what you're so talking about, it seems to be mm. a lot easier to get the information out than when you're trying to fumble around with um, questions to ask. Yeah. Katie, you've been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sparing the time. We will let you get back onto that track. It looks like it's cold. Um, so enjoy, but thank no you very much. Um, and I just want to bring everyone in on that because what she's saying is so relevant to, I think, us all, that, that it's confidence, but it's within your own field where you feel confidence. But is there an element of, I mean, sometimes for me, I have to fake it to make it. Sometimes there's confidence there, sometimes there's not. I don't know how you feel about that. Okay. Be careful how I say this. Okay. The C word is really important. It's come out all day today. Mm -hmm. um, confidence. Now you have to build confidence in yourself, mm. from, from my experience. So even after doing a lot of these, a lot of situations over the last 30, 40 years, I'll avoid stuff that I think is going to over-challenge me. And again, unlike these guys who are built on a achievement, adrenaline, and, and, and fighting the good fight. You know, you won't be beaten. That's the competitive spirit that you all have, which I, that I think I possess, but these guys obviously mm. got it in, in spades. But f from my point of view, I won't, for instance, go, I've been asked to sit in an audience at question time, I won't do it. Really? I do the panel, because I'm there. I'm the person. <laughs> I, can, I can big myself up mm. here, right. whether I'm right or wrong, I've got an opinion that's correct, incorrect or whatever, doesn't matter. But in the audience, I'm one of like everybody else and I'm speaking to the big guys up there. And I, so it's managing yeah. that and that's not, that's, you don't have to fight every fight. Mm. You have to fight the fights that are important to you. And the one thing I've learned getting a little bit older is, you know what, I don't have to do that because I'm, I'm happier over here, yeah. so I'll just be here. Yeah, um, I just want to end on this lovely message um, sent in that says, um, well, from, from Adam, but lots of people saying things like, I hope you all know how inspiring you all are for so many, especially kids. 
As a child, to have sports stars openly talk about their stammers would have been massive for me and helped me in so many ways. I'm 42 now and it's been a massive journey to getting to the point of accepting it, so thank you. And thank you very much. You've all been absolutely incredible. Please keep those questions in. We'll try and get them passed on. But we have come to the end of our session today. So a big thank you to our wonderful panel, to Luke, to John, to Kelly, and also to Katie as well. And thank you all for sending in your questions. And and, and so sorry that we did not have time to ask them all. Um, but also thank you to Richard, Clive, Becky and Gautam and George and to Mike and the technical team here at BBC Yorkshire for making today's event possible. Um, for BBC staff we have another stammering awareness session coming up on the 17th of February run by our inclusive employers so watch out for details of that and please send us your feedback to stammeringsupport at bbc.co.uk. Thank you so much for watching. Bye bye.